thank you very much, uh, IFM, uh, uh, for the invitation and also for the kind introduction. Um, I want to say also hello to to uh, online friends. Uh, John uh, John Saif is there. So uh, hi, John. Uh, uh, I know that you are in Europe. So and uh, uh, so, uh, when IFM asked me to to give the uh, uh, this uh, this talk, I, I said, "Well, I'm working with to, to uh, different regime is working with electrons and working with uh, light, working with photons." And uh, as any of you, like physicists, I have interest in fundamental understanding of nature. So, uh, the, the talk that I prepare is uh, is a uh, uh, peanut butter. Uh, <laughs> Talk. So it's a little bit of everything, uh, just having a, a smooth and nice story and sharing with you guys. Uh, so uh, and uh, but please interrupt me any places that you have questions. There are a lot of details which I'm escaping them. So I'm not telling you the details. I will tell you only the big picture and uh, what uh, what we are going to do. So essentially, um, as I said, I'm 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 dealing with uh, with photons. And uh, and also with uh, with electrons, so I categorized in two different languages, which is uh, photons and massive particles. And indeed, when I work with uh, photons, I, I I'm dealing with Maxwell equations, and how I like the quarian form because it's a relativistic one. Or some people they say that you would like to to have more math, a complicated one, not for undergraduate level. So and uh, on the other side, of course, we deal with the Dirac equation. So usually I use the word of wave function for photon. Uh, well, I'm very well aware of the situation that photons uh, electric field is not a, a solution to the Schrodinger equation. I use it with the way and the fact that, well, if you introduce a uh, riemann silberstein vector, which is if you introduce the electric field and magnetic field to be the real and, and imaginary part of a vector, which I call F, then you can simply write a uh, uh, Maxwell equation in this way. So for, for colleagues that they're online, so I can write it in this way, okay? Fantastic. So uh, with this way, I know that, well, I can treat photon and uh, photons, although is a, massless part, uh, uh, is a massless particle, I can treat it like uh, a solution to kind of the equation. Of course, uh, the spinors that I have it here is a spin one. Uh, spinors and transversality will take the spin zero so fantastic so uh, i'm using this word uh, uh, as wave function for the photons based on this fact well if you do the quantization if you do let's say solve the schrodinger equation or solve the dirac equation or partial wave equation in any case for massive or massless particle what you end up, you will end up that the wave function essentially for photons or for the electron can be labeled by many different degrees of freedom. And one of those degrees of freedom essentially is the energy that you, you, work, you work with. It can be uh, uh, spin degrees of freedom or polarization, let's say in a naive way for photon. You can work also with the statistics. So you can deal what is happening with the statistic of those uh, particles. They are Poissonian, sub Poissonian, or super Poissonian distribution. Or you can also work with, with the spatial distribution of them. So essentially what's going on with the, with the let's say along uh, in the transverse plane to the, to the propagation direction, what is happening with the P and L degrees of freedom. And usually that depends really on the person. So for example, uh, you can solve the element different coordinates. You have many, many ways of the, doing the quantization. But since our optics, or let's call it, yeah, our optics, even in electron microscope, they are cylindrical symmetry. Usually we use this quantization in the terms of a cylindrical coordinate. And one of the best solutions that we do have is Lagrange Gaussian modes, which I'm sure that most of you, you heard about these modes. And uh, when we do that, the quantization happens with L, the quantization happens with P, which they're associated to azimuthal degrees of freedom, phi, and also radial one. So the radial has, was forgotten by people. The people, they forgotten about radial degrees of freedom until 2012, which uh, with one of my supervisors, Enrico, we looked into the quantum property of that, and we show, yes, this is also a good quantum number. And when we, I moved to Canada, uh, uh, in Bob's team, I, uh, we performed the first uh, experiment and showing to the people, well, you can really label the single photon with a quantum 
uh, with the radial degrees of freedom. And this is one of the examples that I always I like and show to people, which is this is an example of the structure, photon of structure light. So essentially what you deal with is not look like a Gaussian, so uh, which is a Gaussian profile, and is not look like a uniform polarization distribution, which is everywhere in the in the transverse plane, you have a certain polarization degrees of freedom, but point by point intensity, phase, and polarization is changing. And this is extremely rich in terms of mathematics and also in terms of topology, which I will try to convince you in a, a couple of slides. And just to, to understand and then uh, distinguish the difference between orbital momentum and also the polarization, the structure light, this is one of the examples. So you can create a beam which essentially has certain polarization degrees of freedom, which is sequel polarization, but ha so having certain orbital momentum degrees of freedom. And this is the distribution that you are expecting is a donut shape which point by point you have thick polarization, but what, what you can do, you can go with the coherence superposition of different thick polarizations by different OM state. And then what you will see, you will see that everywhere you have a linear polarization, but the, this linear polarization is changing in the transverse plane. Well, these example they call it vector uh, vortex modes. And also you can go with very complicated situation. You, you can also control the radial degrees of freedom phase and also polarization, then you will end up with this kind of, let's say, pizza-like uh, pattern. Uh, and uh, you can go even with a more complicated structure. So I will call these structure photons if ideally with photons and you can control them. Well, there are many different ways that people they can control this, that they can generate these uh, kind of modes. The one is, is a plasmonic to, uh, structure. So you can have nanostructures which essentially locally you can excite the uh, different polarization states, and then you can create, for example, orbital momentum. This is one of the examples that the thickness it was about almost 80 nanometer size. So, and you can create uh, or OM beams, or you can create uh, uh, structured beams uh, at a visible domain. You can go with a liquid crystal uh, technology, which I am in favor of that one for uh, for the historical reasons, because I did my PhD in Naples and there we had a very good liquid crystal uh, uh, technologies uh, laboratory, a fabrication lab. And you can, for example, create a beam which upon propagation is accelerating in opposite directions. So these, call, these beams, they call it a beams. So it looks like a, a, a projectile. When you propagate it, then you will see that the, the, the maximum loop of intensity is going on a, on a certain projectile. Of course, it's not violating the rules. Uh, what you will see is look like a, a missile, which essentially the center of intensity is almost constant, but what is happening more energy goes to the tail. As a consequence, the loop of intensity goes in a, in a, in a trajectory. You can create a beam which is really high topological charges. You can create a beam which has orbital emitter of, let's say, 400. And this is one of those examples. So uh, they were able to create uh, orbital emitter of 400, but they did a superposition or, or let's say, interference with, uh, with another beam just to count how many phase jump do we have in azimuthal direction. And what you will get, you will see those small points. And essentially, I counted and I ended up with 399. And one of my, of course, students say, well, uh, Abraham, you could, you could act more smarter. So just write a code that you will have the loops and you can count the maxima. Of course, he was right. So uh, uh, with this liquid crystal technology, you can do many interesting things. Of course, it's still structured light, but remember that also you can apply the technological aspect of this. So one was about uh, creating a, a mirror that people, they call it magic mirror. Have you heard of this? How many people? No. Okay. Oh, of course, I find this. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, and this is a very, very interesting device which goes to several millennia ago in East Asia, which was uh, fabricated by Chinese and Japanese. And it was a mystery until Michael Berry, so Michael Berry resolved the problem. So uh, you, you had a mirror, you look at the mirror, well, you see your image, of course it was like this, as a concave mirror. And then when you shine the light on top of this and you go to the far field, what you see, you see a hidden pattern, which is look like this, appearing on the reflection. And this hidden pattern was independent of the place of image. So you could just watch it, right? So it was not looking like an image that appears in a certain plane and disappears in other plane. So it was in volume. So that was a mystery for people for many years. They didn't, um, not many years, thousand years. Mm -hmm. And people, they didn't know really what is happening. 
uh, but Sir Michael Berry, he resolved it in a very simple fashion. And he said that, well, this should be a transformation from a coordinate to another coordinate. And the energy should be conserved. And if you change the coordinate is a basic calculus, you will have, you will leave the Jacobian, right? And if you do the Jacobian within certain approximation, he found out that, well, the image that appears is essentially is a Laplacian. Laplacian of the height changes. And this is extremely smooth modification on the back of the mirror. So essentially, if I want to tell you in a simple way, you have, if you want to create an image, you have to look at the Laplacian, and Laplacian is not going to look like a Fourier transform, which gives you really the sharp violation or the sharp uh, 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 variations, but essentially it's a very, very smooth variation. And if you cut this smooth variation on the back of the mirror, it's, it's uh, 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 invisible to you because it's really smooth, but if you shine the light and then you go to the far field, that appears as, as an image. So uh, just to tell you that uh, this is, uh, for example, I want to create this GG logo. And essentially what you need to create is creating about, let's say six micron variation over centimeters. If you do that, which is extremely gentle variation, then uh, you will create a pattern, which this pattern essentially is look like that. Of course, uh, it may sound like a very sharp, but uh, remember that over a, over a millimeter, or a couple of millimeters dimension, then when you look at this, you don't see any changes. And essentially, when you shine the light on the top of that, you will create uh, an image in a volume. And we translated this in also in the liquid crystal technology, we created a flat window, essentially, which the refractive indices, they are depending on the location, uh, they are depending on the X and Y, and with the controlling of the refractive index, we were able to create this kind of, let's say, pattern. And essentially, this is an experimental result if you go far and just very close to the, uh, let, let's say, these magic plates, you don't see any phase variation or any images. As soon as you go to the far field, you will see that the image is start to appear. And for these are for different, let's say, logos. And you will see that essentially it works for any, any images. Well, and uh, being in the, field of, in the field of singular optics, I'll always am interested in finding the singularities. So what's happening with the phase singularities there? And essentially, you can you can pop them upon the propagation, and what you will see, you will see an extremely rich topology that appears uh, for the point of singularity upon propagation. So I, I was happy. This was just only the curiosity point. So we say, well, did we understand the magic mirror concept that say Michael Berry proposed, and if that works in reality, uh, or maybe there is some uh, approximation, which essentially it's come out to be a true one. And then, of course, we, we try to link it to, uh, to, to, to the singular optics. And uh, for the next project, we are trying to create entangled magic images. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sure. Stuff? I'm just curious. It's beautiful just as an example. And the point that it works in the far field so that it's not limited to one plane is interesting. I'm just wondering if it also lets you get around any limitations of standard imaging. Can you make sharp patterns that persist further than you know the Rayleigh range would naively make you expect? Uh, very likely, yes. I, my answer will be yes. But th th that depends really how much you want to have the edges to be clarified. Let's say the jumps that you want to clarify. I would say that those images in a certain a planes, they are really, really sharp. But as soon as you are far away, you will see that it gets blurred, not destroyed. But uh, before that, also you have the image. Yeah, yeah. Good point. So, so uh, I want to. Uh, that so far was only about let's say the phase, right, and intensity. Now I want to tell you what is happening with the polarization. I'm sure that you are familiar with the polarization uh, of lights, and uh, what we do usually we map it on a Poincaré sphere the similar things that happens with spin one half that you have it on a blast sphere. But I want to tell you that there is another concept that we usually introduce is a, a point of singularity, but for polarization degrees of freedom. And this singularity is not a zero in the field, is not look like a phase. So it's a mathematical singularity that we define. So when you deal with polarization singularities, of course you can map it on a Poincaré sphere, but then in general, what you have, you are dealing with the polarization ellipse. And these polarization ellipse for two different cases will be singular. One, when the ellipse becomes sequel polarization. Then I have no idea about major and minor axis. So this is what I call it singularity, and I call it C points. 
essentially S1 and S2, which are the Stokes parameters, they will be zero for sequelarizations. The other regime, which I, I have interest in, and I call it again singularity, is a linear polarization. The singularity happens, or let's say the ambiguity happens about the, or, the orientation of the electric field. We don't know what, when this is happening. If you pay attention, in this case, I don't have arrows because in both sides, upon the time it's oscillating. And then S3 Stokes parameter will be zero. I call them singularities, mathematical definition. So is S1, S2 is zero, I call it C point. When S3 is equal to zero, I call it a, a, a linear polarization singularity. So I can create a, a very rich topological charges. I'm not showing you the intensity because now my interest is only polarization degrees of freedom. And I'm asking you what is happening here is a C point. Essentially here is a sequel polarization. So S1 and S2, they are zero. And here on this line, you will see linear polarization and essentially S3 is equal to zero. So, and if I let the beam to be propagating, I will ask you what is happening with this topology. If you see this topology, if you follow the major axis of polarization uh, ellipse, you will see that this major axis is changing, right? So if I start from here, if I do a full rotation, I will see that this is the major, major axis. If I do the full rotation, the major axis is moving like that and comes back to this way. So essentially it's rotating by half pi. Sorry, sorry, what, uh, half two pi. So it will be a pi. So, and if I do a full rotation, I have a two pi. So pi in the rotation of major axis divided by two pi, that will be uh, one half. That's the topology that I define it. So now this is a beam that you can create it. Let them propagate or let it, let it propagate. What is happening with the topology? The topology will stay. The only change that happens, it starts to rotate due to, let's say, going phase that we, we know. But you can deal with different kinds of, let's say, beams. So you can create a lemon, is what people, they call it, and they borrow from this geom uh, differential geometry. You can cre create the star topology. You can create the moon star topology, which is, uh, again, I, I'm saying that the people, they borrow it from the differential geometry. And here, the topological charges that I described to you is plus one half. Here is minus one half. If I do... Uh, uh, rotation around the positive angle, then you will see that the rotation happens in opposite way. That's the reason that you will have a negative sign for the topology. And uh, one question that I was I had, and it took us about seven years to to figure out what is happening when you take this light, this kind of topology, and you do tight focusing. And when you do tight focusing, you are not in the paraxial regime because the paraxial regime means that the electric field is in the transverse plane, and the light is propagating in this way. But if you do tight focusing, what is happening, the wavefront will be tilted. So the electric field has a component along the propagation direction because that will what happened with the K vector. Then depending on the kind of tight focusing, you may get a Z component of the electric field which will be excited further and further and further. So for example, in this case, which the numerical aperture of a microscope is about 0 0.5, 0 0.9, uh, which is what I call it the tight focusing regime. And then if you take one of those topology, for example, the star topology, what is happening at the focus? And then that was a brilliant uh, uh, idea that Gerlux and Peter Banzer in Germany, they had and developed, and they could look at the E, X, E, Y, E, Z of the electric field, all three components, and looking at the phase relative phases between them. And this is what we got. So essentially, in theory, I'm expecting that intensity is not anymore uh, a cylindrical symmetry. It has a threefold symmetry due to the polarization topology that you have. And now what you have EX, you have EY and EZ, but if you look at the upside, you can reconstruct also the phase, uh, relative phase between them. This was a technique that they had another particle moving around and they look at the back scattering and forward scattering, and from this, they were able to, to reconstruct the, the field there. The interesting point is that look at the EZ component. If you look at the EZ component, the value is about 0 0.2, which is, well, it's close to this range. So essentially the Z component of the electric field is also getting excited. So you are in totally non paraxial regime. So I can put the EX, EY and EZ together with the relative phases and I can look at the polarization ellipse again. And my question was, what is happening with the polarization ellipse? And surprisingly what you will see you will see that polarization ellipse still is in ellipse. So you are not violent, so you are not going to a three-dimensional way, but point, this ellipse is tilted in space and has a certain topological structure. And if you plot the major axis of polarization ellipse, 
essentially what you will get, you will get a Mobius. So going from parachial regime to non-parachial regime, a manipulated polarization degrees of freedom allows you to get the three-dimensional topologies. So when we work on this, and one of my students asked me, can we do in non-parachial -par in regime, not doing the inside focusing regime, can we create some sort of topological charges or topologies uh, for light in the non-parachial regime? And that was the reason that we, we, we got interested in uh, not topology which was first uh, uh, discussed by Mark Dennis and Michael Berry, and later on by Mark Dennis and, and Mars Paget. So here, I'm not working about this is single optics, but again, I'm dealing with polarization, which is, which is new. So I can create this topological structure for polarization. So certain points, I have a lemon, certain points, I have a star, and then I have C points, essentially C points with a negative uh, uh, plus one topology or minus one topology. And I let them, the, the beam to be propagating in space, in three-dimensional space. It's not uh, non-parachial, it's a parachial regime. If I engineer it properly, what is happening, then essentially I will get out, by the way, those are the points for the uh, lemon, which is the, the, uh, the blue one, and uh, the red one is the star topology. So essentially they have a plus one topology and minus one topology. So if you let them propagate, what you will see, and following all of these points here, you will see a new topology that appears in a three-dimensional way. Well, that was fantastic. And of course, it started with, uh, with only uh, a theory and, and uh, you know, a curiosity. But later on also, I was asked uh, by, uh, by the way, you can look at the cipher surface, which is a minimal surface between these knots. The, you can characterize the knot in a different way. I don't want to talk about this. So and these are when I was uh, I was in a conference. One of my friends, uh, uh, Avishai and uh, Avishai Karni and Elian Cohen, they asked me a question. They say, "Well, can you give a frame to knots? Because of course, knot is a string, but it's not Mobius, right? Because the Mobius is a, it's, you can have a frame on it. You have a surface. Can you give a frame to the knot?" And we say, why not? We can, we can always try to look at the major axis of polarization ellipse just nearby. And if you do that, essentially you give a frame to the knot and essentially what you will have, you will get a, 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 top, a new kind of topology, which is moving from a string to, to a surface, but this surface also has a twist inside. So if you look at the surface, you will see that it looks like a nucleus has many or certain type of uh, twist upon propagation. And well, we were able to create this, and also we use this twist to send information in our RSA protocol kind. So what we have to say, we say, well, we want to send prime numbers, and what you can do, you can assign it to a certain break with certain twists, and we know how to move from the break points to the knot topology, and we can use it as a backdoor to send information. So we created this and we send it to the other side and only by showing the knot and also the alpha and beta, which are the two arbitrary parameters, we were able to create a way that people they can use uh, knot topology to perform some sort of classical communication. I wouldn't say that is an NMP problem, it's look at RSA protocol, but exponentially difficult to, to be resolved. So uh, and, uh, recently also we, we translated this to a two-way communication, which essentially also Bob can after the measurements can, uh, can create another knot and entangling it and sending back to, to Alice and that will be two-way communication. So, so far we learned about the, let's say intensity, we learned about the things that we can modify, we can learn about the polarization topology that we can modify, what about the frequency? Here's another way. So uh, well, if you deal with a certain frequency of omega, then you have E, X, E, Y, and then in general you have a polarization ellipse. What is happening when you have two beams and the two beams, one of them has a frequency of omega with right-handed and the other one has a frequency of two omega with left-handed. Well, people then say that they will not interfere. Well, you have to be in the second regime or ultra fast. And you will see that the tip of electric field because electric uh, field follows the superposition principle. So if you look at the tip of electric field, what you will see that the tip of electric field is moving in a certain topology, which is not an ellipse because that was for a monochromatic one. It's something like a Lissajous pattern, if, if you remember. It looks like two harmonics, essentially, two orthogonal harmonics. 
So, and uh, of course, what you can do, you can also go beyond these. You can go with frequency of omega, two omega, and three omega with different polarizations. And what you will get now, you will get a knot that in for the tip of electric field is uh, is different from singularities. Now the tip of electric field upon the time is moving on a three-dimensional topology. You can do the tight focusing and what you will get, you will get a zoo of knots. So you will get extremely rich topology, which point by point, you have different kinds of knots. You can analyze them. You have a trefoil, figure eight knot, synchro four knot, or a half link or any other topologies that you want. So that's, that's really interesting. And I'm very much looking forward to, to see an experiment that people, they can look at geometric phase of these kind of beam interacting with the material, which allows you to see beyond the two-dimensional geometric phases. Well, uh, being in Ottawa and next to Paul Kokom, uh, you have the interest to look into, into creating these kind of beams, but in a high harmony at different wavelengths. So one way that we were able to do, which essentially was a, a beautiful work of Bob, uh, Paul Kokom's team, was uh, interacting uh, these, uh, these, let's say, structural light with, with uh, novel gases. And then what you will get, you will get the, due to the conservation law, you can transfer certain orbital momentum to high harmonic generation. So essentially you will get a beam which is uh, having odd frequencies. So you have three omega or five omega or seven omega or 17 omega going to uh, let's say 10 or 15 nanometer uh, wavelength, but all of them, they are structured. So we can, we can just simply transfer what we are creating in the fundamental into the high harmonic regime. And uh, if you look at the perspective of this, you will see that it happens in the atomic level. So this quantization, or let's say this conservation law applies also to orbital momentum degrees of freedom or to spin degrees of freedom. So we were also able to, to, to shape high harmonic generation, uh, 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 depolarization, and also orbital momentum of high harmonic generation. And also you can create, for example, an azimuthal electric field which when you apply it to, to a material, then you will create an azimuthal current. And these azimuthal currents may give you about few Tesla uh, of magnetic field, which is, which is amazing. So with this, I will conclude the structural light, and I will go now to quantum communication and quantum uh, information theory. So what I care about structuring photons? Well, in the first slide, it was clear that well, it L will give me a Hilbert space, which is unbounded. P also gives me a Hilbert space, which is unbounded. And statistic also will give me, which people, they, they work on this. So they work with, uh, for example, uh, uh, coherent state or squeeze state. You can work with the polarization. This is what people in quantum communication, they deal with. They work with the qubit, and essentially you are only manipulating the polarization degrees of freedom. Or you can work also with uh, uh, omega, which what people, they work with multiplexing, wavelength multiplexing. So assuming that you have, uh, you can fix all of them, right? But only working with orbital momentum degrees of freedom. So essentially this is one of the examples. So I can go with L, L equal to plus three to L equal to minus three, including the zero, I have a full seven dimensional space. So I can go also create a discrete Fourier transform of them. This is what you needed for BB84 protocol standard way, but high dimensional way. And then you can look at the, you can look at the information that you can send it. And these, you know, after um, uh, privacy amplification, then you have a cuber, which is the quantum bit error rate. And uh, according to the error that you do have in your system, you define that you have a positive key shared between Alice and Bob or not. So for example, in the standard BB84 protocol after the privacy amplification, if you have 11% of error, you don't have a positive key. Essentially, you have zero positive key. If you say I have 5% of error, I'm in this regime, then I have about, let's say, half a beat perceived photons between Alice and Bob shared. If you go to higher dimension, what is happening? Even if you have, let's say, 11% error, if I go to the dimension uh, 32, essentially, I have about almost five bits of information per sifted photon. So this allows you, by going to that dim higher dimension, allows you to even work in a regime which the noise is high, but still you can send more information more securely than the conventional way that people are thinking about. 
Well, of course, you can build up, uh, let's say, a quantum simulator if you have access to high dimensional space. And uh, uh, you can go, for example, to simulate two dimensional material system, to go to the cycling system, or even right now we are thinking about going to, uh, to a torus, for example, combining a cy two cyclic system together, and then you can simulate a material which is look like a torus or even nanotube, carbon nanotube. So how can we create them in a, in a, in a laboratory? How can we create a high dimensional entangled states? Well, we use uh, 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 bulk optics. So essentially we, we take a photon, uh, UV photon and uh, eliminating an, a BBO crystal, which is a nonlinear crystal, essentially. And then due to the conservation of linear momentum and energy, what you will get, you will get correlated photon pairs. And when you create the photon pairs, then now you can look at them, what is happening with the correlation between biphotons. If it's a polarization degrees of freedom that they are getting entangled, or is a special mode that they are getting entangled and et cetera. So I'm explicitly talking about type one because I'm having interest in high dimensional topologies and high dimensional spatial mode. And essentially, uh, well, uh, Anton Zadinger was, I think, the first person that showed that orbital momentum is concept. So if you pump it with a Gaussian uh, uh, pump, which is Gaussian UV light, then you will get the correlation between orbital momentum degrees of freedom. So signal on either photon, the sum of the orbital momentum will be zero. If that one is minus one, the other one is plus one, and then I don't know which one is which, then you will get entangled state, okay? And plus two, minus two, and et cetera. So if you shape the pump such a way that the pump has orbital momentum of one, sorry, plus one or minus one, then this symmetry is broken. So then you will get the correlation between plus two and minus one and vice versa. You will get plus three and minus two. So that's a, a beautiful way to show that, well, these, these nonlinear process also, the conservation happens in orbital momentum degrees of freedom. And we, we were curious what is happening with the P degrees of freedom. So because also P is important. So P dictates what is happening with the radial parity. And in that beautiful experiment, which was really time consuming, Alicia showed, to, showed that in the, in the SPD process also, the radial parity will conserve. So in addition to L correlation, you have a correlation in P degrees of freedom. So since this was extremely difficult, uh, we had a visitor from, from uh, Fabio Sharino's team. We tried to do, develop a, a, a digital uh, holography on biphoton. So essentially having two cameras, which they are 256 by 256, look like APDs. You can look at the correlation between each pixel within 2.5 nanoseconds. And having a reference beam essentially allows us to look at the correlation between any modes that you want in a fraction of seconds. So essentially within, let's say, one second, we could conclude what is going on in the correlation, not waiting, let's say, several weeks to do the quantum state tomography. And those are, for example, one of the correlation. If you go with the Gaussian pump, you will see the correlation in L or in P. And if you go with, uh, for example, with orbital momentum of, let's say, uh, I think that's a plus one, you will, you will get this correlation. If you go with superposition, you will get this kind of correlation. And finally, if you go with uh, something which is correlation between P, different P values, you will get extremely rich, to, uh, let's say, correlation between P and L's. And uh, of course, we have interest to use these, to use them for high dimensional quantum key distribution. We send it, by, let's say, we had Aris and Bob and essentially connected by a classical channel. And then we, uh, we, we decided to go with different protocols and verifying when high dimensional uh, uh, space will be useful and also overcome some limits that we have in bidimensional cases. And we changed, for example, the protocol of Charles 15, BB84, uh, tomographic way, and also Singapore protocol. And we went for dimension four to dimension eight or dimension two to eight and et cetera. And we had what, what we are expecting in terms of experiment and, and in terms of theory. And at the, at the end, we look at the, the key rate essentially, which is given by the rate that we can modify it and looking at the sifting protocol as well. And finally having an established, let's say, key. And it and, and, and turned out that while I'm in favor of high dimensional, but due to the imperfection in the laboratory and also problems and challenges that I have in the laboratory, only dimension four is the best one with the current detector, current SLMs, and et cetera. 
And that was fully automatic, by the way, I and mean, no human interface. It, we make the, 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 the two computer that are involved make a decision which protocol they have to go for and what they have to choose. And at the end, they will calculate the, the error rates. And it turned out that only dimension four with the detectors that we had at the time and we did a generation and detection scheme was the best. Right now, we have a new setup, which is dimension 16 is the best one. So uh, with this also, I want to tell you, you can also look at the fundamental way and see if whether the high dimensional also will give you a benefit. And one of these way is looking at the optimal cloning attack to a channel. So essentially you can have uh, a communication channel. Of course, we have no cloning theorem, but you can ask yourself, what are the best way that I can make a, a, as good as the original copy? So you can attempt to add, attack to the channel and getting some kind of information there. And we realize is that if you go to higher dimension, this attack is more easy to be revealed. So the error that you introduce due to the attack is way higher than the two dimensional cases. And essentially I can do, give you that it shows as a, as a kind of fidelity. If you go to higher dimension, the fidelity of the cloning will be one divided by two plus one divided by D plus one. So going to higher dimension, brings the fidelity lower and lower and lower. It means that you have more errors in the channel. So that was another way which we, uh, again, we automatic, uh, automatize uh, setup and we look for different attacks, intercept percent and also optimal cloning attack. And we look at the process uh, matrix of a channel and we find out well, going to higher dimensions is way, way uh, easier to reveal the existence of Evostropa. Fantastic. And we uh, students, they like to go outside, sometimes having a roof party. So they, they went to the two different groups uh, of, uh, at the University of Ottawa, and they try to send uh, single photons, but going to the dimension, the dimension four, it's instead of sending zero, one, they send zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one bit, going to the four dimensional space, because we knew that is, is good. Uh, is better for our schemes and try to send also with uh, entangled pair. They, they, they work with entanglement. And finally, they were able to show that, well, you can go from two dimensional space to four dimensional space and what you will get as a benefit. So in one night, for example, we had about 11% uh, uh, error, if you look at here. So for two dimensional, we had about 0 0.43 bits per, uh, sorry, 0.5% error. And we had corresponding one, which was 0. 43 bits uh, per sifted photon. And uh, of course, this error came from the building vibration, the turbulence, uh, many, many other issues. So it was time dependent. And in a certain time, we had about 11% error, which we couldn't use the two dimensional one. So we changed the protocol to four dimensional and still we get a bit straight, which was higher than the two dimensional in the base scenario. So that was, uh, but that was a good one. And right now we have a free space link between the University of Ottawa and NRC, which is 5.4 kilometers. Uh, should I say it will be recorded and just uh, for two years, it was down the link. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, politicians, they came, they want to see the link. And I realized that the window was broken due to the storm and pigeons, they went inside and it's kind of old. So I had to spend thousands on, on just cleaning those, uh, the, 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 the link essentially. And we do have centimeter, which essentially we can monitor the turbulence because the turbulence is the main factor for the free space uh, uh, communication, classical and quantum. Uh, uh, and why we choose 5.4 kilometers because is the turbulence, amount of turbulence that you will see on the horizon is identical to amount of the turbulence that you will see from the ground station to a satellite. So we can essentially simulate the turbulence perfectly there. And we also, we have adaptive optics system with a, with a supercomputer, which quickly can adapt and, and see what is the turbulence. And also with the adaptive optic system, you can eliminate the turbulence there. So with these also, I would say that they didn't only like the, the, the roof party, but also they like the pool party. So they decided to bring equipment to, to a swimming pool first. And uh, uh, you see, of course, uh, Alicia is trying, Alice is trying to do communication with, uh, with Bob, which is Azad. And you know who is doing the main work is Felix which is in the swimming pool and trying to align the optics. And, and uh, uh, it was a ca classical channel, which was going on the, on, the, on the ladder. And we have a quantum channel, which, which was under the water. So they were sending uh, uh, information through the water. Of course, we have to monitor the turbulence there as well. And we realized that the turbulence is way different from the free space. It's extremely stronger. 
And uh, we try also, uh, they decided to have a barbecue in a, in a cottage uh, in the Ottawa River. Uh, I don't say to MSA people. Uh, then, uh, they they spent two weeks there and they try to, uh, to send information in the real field, essentially, when you have algae, you have you know um, particles in the air, in the water. So we were not able to go more than six meters there because we were extremely unlucky. We received a couple of rains at that period, which essentially destroys the the the, the, the condition that we expected. And yes, uh, well, uh, well, and people they say is a submarine application. So uh, essentially, you have a $100 million facility underwater, and they want to do communication. What is the communication that they do is acoustic mainly. So even from North American coast, we can listen to Russian, uh, Russian submarines. Uh, um, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's the argument. For myself, no, there are many sensors underwater, and you want to extract the information from them. And uh, one way that people they do right now is sending someone down and take the sensor off and replacing a new one, which is which is not cost effective. Okay, so uh, you can go with optical domain, even if it's a kilobit per second, still you can extract the information that you want uh, with, with minimum amount of, let's say, money, I would say. And then, uh, and of course, multiplexing is extremely important, which is going to higher dimension because you can send more information at the same time. What we realized that while well, going to the dimension four is extremely difficult because we need to have a compensation for the turbulence. Do you know that? Yes, we can do. And the, the very recent one just during the pandemic or at the beginning of pandemic was going to NRC and having a flume and having a, a train which you can, you can essentially control the distance and you can look at the distance that you can send the information in polarization and also in the vortex uh, vector vortex mode on orbit and into degrees of freedom. And it's a setup that look like is not really look like the, the laboratory, quantum optics laboratory is very uh, fun one, I would say. So you should follow the protocols going inside, uh, which is safety protocols, of course. And uh, yes, and then for just to tell you why water is a very different environment, Alicia is sending two very bright blue and green laser. And I asked her to do that uh, intentionally because we want to see what's going on with the scattering and absorption in the water. And you will see that mainly after the distance is blue. Why? Because that's the transparent window, which I escaped one slide about that. that that's really a limited window for water that you can allow, it allows you to do optical communication in water, okay? And the maximum distance that you can go based on Beer's law is about 200 meters. But even 20 meters is sufficient to do, let's say, complication between submarine and a plane or, uh, or drone or satellite. And uh, uh, we were able to reach to the distance of almost 30 meters, which is, was a record. And still, uh, we were able to send about 80 kilobits per second, which is really, really high. Okay. Oh, yes. Yes, uh, excellent, excellent question. So uh, essentially, you can go with uh, attenuated current state or you can go with SPDC. Of course, it's very, very unlikely that you can get a UV light uh, SPDC there. We were able to get it close to green for some of the experiment. For some, some of the other experiments, were just simply attenuated laser beam. I, I hope that I answered to your question. Uh, what time is it? Uh, just having... uh, you have five or six minutes. Oh, five or six minutes. Ah, that's good. Is, uh, I went. Uh, I had so many materials to show. So now uh, I briefly discuss about the uh, uh, structure matter, right? Which is electrons. So we uh, with a very nice theoretical work of one of my colleague, Konstantin uh, 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 Bliok, in two thousand seven. We realized that whatever we do with photons, you can also translate it to massive particle. Essentially, what you deal is a wave function. As I said to show to you in the beginning, also I can have a wave function for a photon. And on the other side, well, the, the equation that you have it for matter wave is a relativistic one, is a Dirac equation, or you can go with non-relativistic regime, which is a Schrodinger equation. I assume that there is no potential, it's a free particle moving around. Okay. If you do a little bit of mathematics, which is extremely simple. What you will see that this can be translated into a Schrodinger equation like or partial wave equation, 
if we assume that you have a certain k vector or p momentum and certain energy for for the particle and if you assume this then you will get to a schrodinger uh, sorry partial wave like approximation which is exactly describing that you can have the same wave function for massive particles what you have it for electric for photons can be done also with electrons and this is one of the examples you can get the transverse mode which is uh, uh, oh, okay <laughs> So uh, you get the, you get the transverse mode, which is essentially is given again with the same quantization, which is L and P, and also you have a longitudinal one, which is uh, given by uh, what they call a longitudinal index, which tells you that you have you are dealing with a, with a matter wave, which essentially in the space time is look like this within the first approximation, by the way. So it's a Gaussian in the in the in the long uh, z, but also it carries a certain phase or let's say probability distribution. Now I am careful, I'm using the probability distribution and, and uh, others. But what is happening more, photon doesn't have a charge, right? Doesn't have an electric charge, but electron, if you want to, let's say, create structured electron beams, then electron has an electric charge. Then what is happening with the electric charge? Essentially, you can do the, uh, do the calculation to find what's going on with the current density, and essentially, you will deal out with, uh, with, uh, with an azimuthal current, which this azimuthal current will give you a magnetic moment for these structured electrons. It looks like that you have an electron. It looks like an atom. They're taking the, uh, the nucleus out, but the electron is propagating and having an orbital angular momentum. And well, our electron is not rotating. It's a wave function. If you, I, can, I can plot it to you what is happening if you go with the classical regime. But essentially, what you are creating, you are creating a magnetic moment due to the azimuthal current that you have. And this magnetic moment is quantized. It's given by L mu b, which is, which is just given here in the lower part. And the L factor that you have is showing to you that is unbounded. It's not looked like the spin. So spin is bounded by plus and minus one half. And here is L mu b. And people that they work in electron microscopy, they appreciate this because we don't have a spin polarized electron microscope. We, we, have, we don't have it in the middle energy range. So this is another way that people, they can create uh, a, a magnetic moment for the electrons and you can use them in electron microscopy. So that was the first, it was done by Yoshida in 2010. Uh, then it was done by uh, Joe Verbeck in the holographic approach which you can control the phase of the electron beams. And finally, you can, uh, due to the diffraction or due to the interference, you will get an electron beam, single electron, which carries orbital momentum. Or you can do it with, a, uh, with electric field, or you can go, do it with a more sophisticated hol holographic approach, which uh, I think it took us about two years to, to approach this range. So essentially, if you have a single electron in electron microscope going into a hologram, you will see the diffraction orders, and you will see in the first order of diffraction, you have an electron which is twisted or having certain orbital angular momentum or certain magnetic moments. So I will try to be quick why this is important, because essentially you can create any electron wave function that you want with any approaches that you, you can do. So you can create, for example, an, a, a hologram, a really complicated hologram, which shapes both the amplitude and phase of the electron, and essentially there's a, there's a result that you will have it here. It has a certain P value and certain also L value. And uh, this is the shape of the hologram essentially uh, uh, that you will see. We are talking about two, 20 nanometer dimension. This is a 2D version of the, that, you know, uh, making a nice, uh, uh, let's say movie of that, that what is it look like in reality. So the total dimension that you have is about, let's say, less than, less than five micrometers, but you have to craft it uh, with electron beams. And then you can create the highest topological charges that you can do, for example, L equal to a thousand uh, orbital momentum. So essentially you have a thousand mu B magnetic moment. And, uh, uh, and also you can, for example, create an alien, the same scenario that uh, a DRE, one of my uh, good colleague in Tel Aviv, he did. Uh, you can create vessel beams for electrons because 
then the basal wheels, you know that uh, it has this property that is not changing. It's not depending on the, on the plane wave. Essentially, it's the same shape, uh, shape invariant. And then you can also create a, a sorter, which essentially you can uh, extract the information after the interaction with the sample. So essentially, you have a sample, which have, you have absolutely no idea what's going on with the sample. But then uh, after the mode sorter, you will understand what are the magnetic and the magnetic property of the material by doing the proper pole selections. Essentially, that was a magnetic uh, uh, dipole laid on in the, uh, in the transverse field. And then we interacted an electron with it. And then we had a sorter, which was decomposing in different orbital momentum values. And finally, we were able to create uh, and reconstruct the, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 the value of orbital momentum due to this interaction. And from this, we were able to reconstruct the magnetic field, which essentially here you had about, about almost one Tesla. And around this, you had about, about milli Tesla. So, and uh, this is the, uh, the illustration of how this system works in a real electron microscope. Essentially, you go from one plane, you have an electrostatic version of that, which right now we, we just feel the pattern. Uh, essentially, that electrostatic interaction will give you a dynamical phase, which you can shape the electron, and uh, finally you can sort them in a, in a certain basis. So, um, and there are different ways also you can look at the uh, look at different approaches that you can shape the electrons either with a magnetic field or with electric field uh, most of them they are uh, 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 geometric phase or very phases but one of them is a two form the other one is a one form uh, essentially if you deal with the electric field essentially you are dealing with uh, with the first approaches while if you go with a, a magnetic field you are dealing with a two form and uh, we, we explore both regimes re regimes essentially by applying only uh, electric field between two plates and the electric field when it's changing from minus 10 volt to plus 10 volt, you can create an electron vortex beam, which is the topological charges is almost about, let's say 20 to minus 20. So with simple uh, controlling the voltage, you will be able to create electron beams with a certain topological charges. And uh, I will not talk about this, sorry, it's, uh, it's very complicated because that's uh, solving a very important puzzle in, uh, in electron microscopy, which is a spin polarized electron microscope. Uh, you, know, you know about Schrenger lock, right? So Schrenger lock does not work for electron. It works for the atoms or ions. When, it, you, when you try with a single electron, it does not work. And the precision that you, have to ha you should have is about the wavelength of the electron, which is a picometer. So which is a puzzle and Bohr and Pauli, they had a discussion about that well, the spin doesn't make sense for free electron or it should be bounded electron. So I will encourage you to read about that. It's, it's a very really interesting puzzle. And what we propose instead, we say, well, I know how to work with orbital momentum, how to sort it, but I can create a device that couples spin to orbital momentum. Now, instead of sorting spin, I can sort orbital momentum and then I can, I can filter out uh, the scenario. And of course, you can look at the time probe, which is essentially today during the visit I mentioned, you can have an electron microscope, which you can create electrons in a pulse way, and then you can eliminate the sample and you can do pump pop experiment. And essentially you can create electron vortex beam with really high topological charge, uh, sorry, with a really fast way to control the topological charge, essentially in out second way of controlling the electron, uh, 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 electron topological charge. And uh, with this, with this, this, and this, I will stop here, <laughs> okay? So, uh, well, we are interested in fundamental studies, building up the first quantum electron microscope in Canada, hopefully next year, if it will get funded. And then we're helping with the Quantum Internet Canada, which with some of colleagues, uh, uh, we are in a team and we are trying to develop uh, that. And uh, uh, of course, I should say that, well, this is a work of many, many people, including members of my team, which I learned so many different things from them. And each day I'm learning from them. And many, many great scientists all around the world, uh, which they helped me to, to learn the, this process. So my apologies, I went three minutes more. <laughs>